Let's turn to Ruth chapter 3, please. Ruth chapter 3. I'm going to read this entire chapter, verses 1 through 18, and then I'm going to pray and ask God for His help for us as as we get into this uh, really remarkable chapter of Scripture. Ruth chapter 3, starting with verse 1. Follow along in your Bibles as, uh, as as I read. It says this, Then Naomi, her mother in law, said to her, My daughter, should I not seek rest for you that it may be well with you? Is not Boaz our relative with whose young women you were? See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Wash, therefore, and anoint yourself, and put on your cloak, and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. But when he lies down, observe the place where he lies. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. And she replied, all that you do, all that you say, I will do. So she went down to the threshing floor and did just as her mother-in-law had commanded her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk, and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. Then she came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down. At midnight, the man was startled and turned over, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. He said, who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. And he said, may may you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter, You have made this last kindness greater than the first, in which you have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask. For all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. And it is true that I am a redeemer. Yet, there is a redeemer nearer than I. Remain tonight, and in the morning, if he will redeem you, good, let him do it. But if he is not willing to redeem you, then as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. Lie and go down, uh, lie down until the morning. So she lay at his feet until morning, but she rose before one could recognize another. And he said, let it not be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. And he said, bring the garment you are wearing and hold it out. So she held it out, and he measured out six measures of barley and put it on her. Then she went into the city, and when she had came to her mother-in-law, she said, how did you fare, my daughter? And she told her all that the man had done for her, saying, these six measures of barley he gave to me. For he said to me, you must not go back empty-handed to your mother-in-law. She replied, wait, my daughter, until you learn how the matter turns out for the man will not rest, but will setter, settle the matter today. I want to preach to you this morning on this title, You're Not Empty. You are not empty. Let's pray and ask God for his help as we get into Ruth chapter 3. Please pray with me. Father, We come before you and we say thank you for this word. This is your word that is inspired. It is written for us for for today to challenge us, to to strengthen us, to grow us. God, I pray that as I preach this morning that you will help me to preach not my own ideas, but to preach your word. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You're not empty. I wonder how that phrase hits you. You are not empty. Well, some people, no matter who they are, feel like no matter what, they are empty. Boris Becker, a famous tennis player, said this. After he had risen to the top of the tennis world, still feeling himself suicidal in life. He said this. He said, I had won Wimbledon twice before, once as the the youngest player. I was rich. I had all the material possessions I needed. 
It's the old song of movie stars and pop stars who commit suicide, he said. They have everything, yet they are so unhappy. They have no inner peace. In a similar vein, a famous author was once asked, in retrospect, what he would wish he would have known as a child. And this author said, as a kid, I wish I would have known that when you get to the top, there's nothing there. You know, I wonder how many times we as Christians think like the world and believe that there is some kind of status, some kind of success, some kind of riches, some kind of accomplishment out there that can satisfy the emptiness that we feel in here. I'm concerned that so often Christians look just like the world in their aspirations, believing that they can find fullness in the facilities that this world provides, or believing that they can find completeness in the comforts of this world through money, recognition, status, safety, a better house, a better environment. And what I'm concerned about, church, is this, is that we can live our entire lives pursuing these things, believing that something in this world will give me the fullness that I so long for, and we will find ourselves at the end of our life empty. As empty as the world around us. As empty and sad and depressed and miserable and lonely and empty as everybody else. This morning, what I want you to see is that there is a fullness beyond anything that this world can give you. This morning, I want you to know God's love. I want you to be filled this morning with God's love. And I want you to know that if you are in Christ, you're not empty. Seed is a common theme in the book of Ruth. Seed. Everybody say seed. In search of seed, Naomi and her family, she had a husband and two boys. They, they were in search of seed and they left the little town of Bethlehem and they found themselves in the fields of Moaz because there was a famine in Bethlehem. There they began to work and find some food, but over a 10-year period, things did not turn out well for Naomi. At first, things looked fine. Her two boys fell in love with, with some uh, young, pretty uh, Moabite women. One of them was named Ruth. However, over time, her husband died, and her two boys died, and she was left with one daughter-in-law who chose to remain loyal, and her name was, help me out, Ruth who the book is named after. Now, Ruth travels with her mother-in-law, Naomi, back to a town that Naomi is from, a town Ruth has never been to. And what is the town? A little town of Bethlehem. Remind you of another story? Listen, seed is a common theme in the book of Ruth. In the same town, some 1,200 years later, there is going to be one coming, another seed, the seed actually of who? Ruth, in the same little town of Bethlehem. It's all about seed. In chapter 2, we saw that uh, it just so happened, right, that, that Ruth ended up on the fields of Boaz. Well, it didn't just so happen. God is orchestrating the entire thing. Throughout the entire story, what we see is that Ruth is not the main character, Naomi's not the main character, and even Boaz is not the main character. But the main character is this character behind the scenes that you don't see. And it is Yahweh. It is the Lord who is moving the entire time. This is a book for those of us who are confused in this life. 
This is a book for us, uh, those of us who live day to day just feeling like your life is, is aimless and, and purposeless and you're wondering why you're even living day to day to day. This is a book for you which says God is in control and His story is your story and it has a good ending. He's writing something better than you could ever come up with. And so Ruth then, just simply through everyday faithfulness, finds herself where in chapter 2? In the fields of Boaz. Now Boaz happens to be a close relative. This doesn't mean uh, when, when uh, we see Boaz called a relative here in chapter 3 that Naomi is thinking of like some kind of West Virginia, we're going to marry your cousin sort of thing. All right? If you're from West Virginia, I apologize. Uh, but, but, but rather relative here would be sort of a common ancestor that a clan develops from. So to call them a relative means that we're part of the same clan, and we're going to get into why that matters in just a moment. By the time we get to chapter 3, the temporal uh, hunger pains have been satiated by, uh, by the grain that they've received from Boaz. But there's a bigger problem that Ruth has, and that is that she's living in Naomi's house, and that she is currently a widower, or a widow. And a widow with no children in this ancient world was basically a, a, a seal of your lifelong poverty. In this patriarchal society they lived in, if, if you were a widow, you had no husband, and you had no children, then basically you were looking at poverty for the rest of your life. And that's how chapter 2 ends. Ruth and Naomi, two widows living together. So as chapter 3 begins, what we see is that the, the light kind of turns on for Naomi. I think she's starting to feel a little better. She's feeling a little more bold. And she looks at Ruth and she says, girl, we got to get you a husband. So here's what we're going to do. And she came up with what I'm going to call, uh, for the younger ears in the room, I'm going to just call this questionable advice. You guys know what I'm talking about? Naomi comes up with some questionable advice. In the first couple verses here, we see, uh, um, we see this questionable advice. She says, my daughter, in verse 1, should, should I not seek rest for you that it may be well with you, a.k.a. you got to get married. She says, is not Bo Boaz a relative or one of our clansmen? whose young women you were with. See, he is winnowing barley at the threshing floor. Now remember, Boaz was a farmer of sorts, and he had these fields, and they were working in the barley season. And now Boaz is winnowing barley. What they would do is they would bring in all the barley from the fields, and they would put it on the threshing floor. The thresh threshing floor sat at the bottom of the hill typically. Uh, away from the city, just, just a little a ways where there would be some breeze coming through. And they would bring the barley in and they would beat out the, the barley. And they would separate the kernel from the husk. And then they would take the pitchforks and throw it up into the air and, and the chaff would be swept away by the breeze. And they would be left with piles of pure grain. This was a celebratory season in ancient Israel. This is the moment where they're being able to sing and dance and enjoy the bounty of the harvest. And so the whole town would know that Boaz and the crew were down at the threshing floor winnowing barley. You could hear the songs from up in Bethlehem. And so she has this idea. She says, isn't Boaz going to be on the threshing floor tonight? Look at verse 3. If you're sitting next to your child, just cover their ears right now. Wash, therefore, anoint yourself, put your cloak on, go down to the threshing floor, but don't make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. She's calculated. Just wait. Wait until he's happy. Wait until he's full. And then when he lies down, observe the place where he lies. Very important step. You don't want to be uh, uh, uncovering the feet of the wrong man, all right? This would be quite embarrassing. Observe where he lies down, then go and uncover his feet and lay down, and he will tell you what to do. 
Now, the Bible is always subtle. The author here is very subtle in the way he puts this out there. But I think the ancient reader would read this and say, wow, this is like some racy material right here. She's really instructing Ruth in this way. Put on your best clothes. Wash yourself. Put on some perfume. Make yourself appealing. And then go uncover his feet and just lay down. And then when he wakes up, listen, he will tell you what to do. What do you think, what do you think Naomi has in mind? Well, I think I know what Naomi has in mind. I think Naomi is trying, good motives, trying to find a husband, all right, for Ruth to secure some temporal uh, standing in this world. But I think her approach is uh, questionable at best, sinful at worst. According to the law in, in, in Leviticus, the man who would have intercourse with the virgin is by law required to marry her. And so if Ruth then can seduce Boaz into an evening, then Boaz will be required to marry Ruth. I think that's the advice. Well, as the story goes on in verse 5, we don't know if Ruth understands the intention or not, but in verse 5, uh, it just simply says that Ruth obeys Naomi. All that you say I will do, she says. And so Ruth now goes down to the threshing floor. And at this point, uh, the, the rest of the story takes place in, in, at the dead of night. It is dark. Uh, the author actually changes from calling Boaz and Ruth by their name, and he begins to call them the man and the woman, almost as if to say you can't make out their faces in the dark. They're anonymous. There's mystery. There's intrigue here. She goes down to the threshing floor, and, and when Boaz had eaten and drunk, there's no reason to believe that he was drunk. Uh, Boaz had a strong reputation in Israel. However, it does say that he had ate and he had drank, meaning he was full, he was satisfied, he, his heart was merry. He laid down to go to sleep at the end of a heap of grain. Now, this entire time, Ruth is watching where Boaz goes to lay down. I can only imagine how her heart was beating, the fear that might have been in her own soul as she waited for this moment, wondering what would actually happen as she took this risk. Then finally, it says, she came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down. I'm sure she just laid there with her eyes wide open. It says nothing of her falling asleep. I'm sure fear gripped every part of her body as she wondered what would happen if and when Boaz wakes up. Now in verse 6, it says, at midnight. Midnight is always an interesting time in the Bible. Big things happen at midnight. Monumental things happen at midnight. And at midnight, it says that Boaz was stirred. He was startled. He woke up. If you look at what the scholars say, they, they say his feet were probably cold. Pretty simple. He woke up. And as he turns over, it says, behold. That's, that's another way of saying, can you believe it? Or, Oh my goodness, or lo and behold, there was a woman at his feet. Now at this point, we are led to the climax of the story. How is Boaz going to respond to Ruth laying at his feet? Well, he first, he can't see the woman, so he simply asks, who are you? And there's this transition that comes in verse 9. But before I get into it, let me talk about the risk that Ruth is taking here. I want you to understand this great level of risk. But in order to understand the risk, you have to understand something about Jewish culture. There was the, what was called in the Jewish culture the kinsman redeemer. Everybody say kinsman Redeemer. This idea uh, that there would be a relative uh, who would be able to buy, actually had the right to buy you out of slavery. 
If you had fallen into tough times, if you lost some property, if you owed a debt, the kinsman redeemer could come along and would purchase you out, would pay off your debt. Now, we don't know this for sure, but most scholars assume that Naomi probably had property uh, that belonged to her husband that she had lost over the last 10 years. And so now that she's back in Bethlehem, there is a property that she has a debt on or that she has lost And a kinsman redeemer, someone of their clan, the closest to them, could come to them and pay off the debt. And in paying off the debt, uh, he would then essentially purchase the entire uh, inheritance that is Naomi's, which would include Ruth. And he would be required then to marry Ruth and to provide offspring for Naomi through Ruth. Ruth. Now, with that said, here's Ruth taking all of this risk. Think of the risk. First, where was Ruth from? Help me out. Come on. Where? Moab, right. She was a Moabite. Now, we've talked about this a couple weeks ago, but uh, the Moabite women had at one point seduced the sons of Israel. And and as a result, the Moabite women were cursed, or Moabites as a whole were cursed. So Moabites were stereotyped as being a uh, seductress. Maybe, just maybe, Naomi gave Ruth this advice with her own stereotype in mind. Oh, you're a Moabite. You're a seductress. You're good at this. Go and seduce the man. So here she goes out, all right, a Moabite, facing potential uh, racial discrimination, uh, being misunderstood by people around. Her whole reputation is at now at stake as she goes out. She's uh, facing possibly being misunderstood by Boaz himself. R- Ruth is risking everything to serve Naomi. Now, let me just pause and ask a brief application question. If Ruth was willing to risk so much to serve someone, what are you willing to risk for the sake of the gospel? Like When you think about somebody who's willing to risk their comforts to leave their homeland and to go to a foreign land on mission, why do they do that? Why does somebody choose to sit down and have an awkward conversation with a friend to talk to them about God and risk being rejected? Why might somebody choose to to remain in a tough part of the city and, and risk having less comforts in this life? Is it not because the gospel is worth it? Is it not because there's somebody that needs to be served and I've got the opportunity to serve? Now listen, church, what I'm saying is this, is we are, we are part of a long tradition of risk, but it doesn't come through an empty mentality. If you think empty, you will have no ability to risk in life. Risk comes through a full understanding of the fullness of of what God has given us. I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me stick with the story and we'll get back to that in just a moment. Ruth here is willing to risk. And so in verse 9, check this out, Ruth changes the plan. When when Boaz wakes up, what what did Naomi instruct Ruth to do? Naomi said, stay passive and just simply do whatever Boaz tells you to do. Well, she changes it up. When Boaz wakes up, Ruth tells Boaz what to do. Look at it in verse 9. He wakes up, who are you? And she replies, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are are a redeemer. That is risk. That is bold. Now remember in chapter 2, verse 12, Boaz actually said to Ruth, in a blessing to her, in a prayer to her, may you find refuge under the wings of God. 
And Ruth is essentially saying, Boaz, you prayed that I would receive the protection and love of God. Now you become that protection and love of God for me. That's bold. She's proposing to him. Don't tell me that a woman can never propose to a man. All right? Here's a proposal. It's bold. It's risky. But listen, it's not self-serving. Part of her risk is actually the fact that she's doing everything to serve Naomi. Uh, Boaz even recognizes this. In verse 10, he says, may you be blessed of the Lord. This is his response. May you be blessed of the Lord for this. May you be blessed of the Lord, my daughter. You have made this last kindness greater than the first, in that you have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. Meaning, uh, Boaz is on the older side. We don't know how old he is, but he's on the older side. And he's saying, look, you are risking not even having a child because you're coming after an older man. If you really wanted to secure something for yourself, you'd go for one of these young men in the field. But you're coming to me, seeking marriage, not based on whether poor or rich, meaning not based on passions, going after someone of, uh, that, that you love, of your own class, if you would, or rich, going after greed. But what Boaz recognizes is that Ruth is seeking to serve Naomi. What Ruth is not just simply trying to manipulate herself into a marriage, which was Naomi's scheme, I believe. But rather, Ruth is trying to find a redeemer for the whole family. She's trying to secure an inheritance for her mother-in-law. In this moment, she's not self-serving, but she is serving Naomi. And so he blesses her. He's amazed by this. This brings us into this climax in the story, and that is this, this question. Will Boaz be willing to redeem Ruth? Will Boaz marry Ruth? And the answer we get immediately is yes. He's willing to do this. But it's, it's, a, it's a yes, but. All of a sudden, there's a new kind of problem that arises. A turn of events. In verses 11 and 12, we see the or 12 and 13, we see this curveball, or the but. He says, yeah, I'll do this. However, there is another Redeemer. There's somebody else that is closer in line, and we don't know how this all worked out, but they had some kind of system to determine who the Redeemer would be. He said, there's somebody else that's closer in line to be the Redeemer. Let me check with him first. And if he's unwilling to redeem you, then I will go ahead and redeem you. This curveball. You know, so much of life is a curveball. And I love the way the author just lays this out for us. There's always like a little movement and then a curveball. We get some progress and then we take a step back. Two steps forward, one step back. And that's, that's real life, isn't it? Like we always think that we're going to just go, turn around the corner and finally arrive. But the reality is, is that curveballs come at us. And so we're waiting once again. We'll get to that next week. I love the way, though, this story ends in verse, in verse uh, uh, 13. After he assures her that she will be redeemed... He simply says this. He says, lie down until morning. Now let's just pause there for a second. Nighttime was a very dangerous time for the ancient, uh, ancient people, particularly the women. During the time of the judges, when everybody just did according to their own eyes, they just lived however they wanted to live, this was a very dangerous time for women to be out after dark in the night. Uh, Ruth would be exposed to possible violence, Thieves. And so instead of just simply sending her home at this point, he says, lie down until morning. And that word lodge there is an indicator that there was no sex involved this night. 
but rather what we see is purity and protection. He says, I'm going to create a safe space for you, and you're going to stay right here. He protects Naomi. And so it says, she lied down at his feet until morning. I can't imagine the rest that she received after the fear of not knowing what's going to happen, after the fear of wondering, will he, will he be willing to even be the Redeemer? To know that whether it's him or somebody else, to know that there is a Redeemer allowed Ruth, I'm sure, to just fall fast asleep under that kind of assurance and that kind of protection. Church, do I need to remind you there is a Redeemer? Do you know the rest of the redeemed? Do you know the sleep of the redeemed? It's been said that you can't sleep when you have a hundred things on your to-do list. When you know that there's work to be done, you cannot sleep. Yet the Bible says that God grants sleep to those He loves. How is that possible? It's because there is a Redeemer. And for us, the work is finished. And so, yeah, in this temporal world, you might have a hundred things on your to-do list, but the greatest work is finished, and we can rest and we can sleep in that finished work knowing that we are and will be redeemed by our Redeemer. Amen? Amen. You with me? I hope you're not getting rest right now as we, as we chat. Get that later. Boaz then goes out on a limb here to uh, guard her reputation. Ruth wakes up early in the morning uh, before everybody else wakes up, probably to just get home before the crowds start coming out. Because you can only imagine what people would say if they saw the young Moabite woman walking home empty-handed from the threshing floor. Oh, I wonder what happened, they would say. Gossip would spread very quickly. And so Boaz said, nobody's going to know that you were here. And, and then he does something. He, he gives her, it says, six measures of barley. One of the reasons he would have done this would be to give her an easy answer, an easy out, if someone were to see her walking home. Six measures of barley. By the way, that's, that's about 60 pounds, scholars say, of barley. It says he straps it on her. He puts it on her himself, probably on her back. And she walks home. If somebody sees her now, coming up from the threshing floor, oh, there's no gossip. It's, oh, she was getting some barley, right? But there's another reason that he gave her the six measures of barley. Ruth goes on home, and in verse uh, 17, she, she gets home to Naomi, and Naomi wonders, how did it go? And so she fills her in on what happened, and she turns to the six measures of barley, and in verse 17, she says that he gave these to me, these six measures of barley, for he said to me, you must not go back empty-handed to your mother-in-law. Does anybody remember the way that Naomi described herself in chapter 1? Bitter, Mara, what else? She said, I am empty. Right in front of her daughter-in-law, Ruth, she said, the Lord has left me with nothing. I'm empty. And we see that emptiness transformed now through the common means of people, Boaz, Ruth, to you are not empty. God wants Naomi to know you are not empty. Oh, and why six measures of barley and not seven? Everything is intentional in God's Word. Why six and not seven? Well, seven is the number of completion. Six is to say there's a little more seed to come. The story is not yet over. There's more seed to come. Amen? Amen. What happens? We're going to see this next week. But I've got to get there. There's a royal dynasty uh, that Ruth is going to be part of. 
Ruth is going to have that seventh measure of seed, if you would, in her womb. A baby's going to grow. And then some years later, there's going to be another baby in the womb in the little town of Bethlehem. There is a Redeemer. Jesus Christ, our Lord. This Jesus is going to be born in Bethlehem. He's going to be raised. He's going to grow in stature. He's going to teach. He's going to have disciples. He's going to go to the cross. And He's going to do all of this so that you might know that you are not empty. That you have the fullness of all that you need in Jesus Christ. You know, some people say, well, I imagined my life would be different. I imagined things would look differently. I imagined I'd have a different home. I imagined I'd have different kids or a different spouse. Things haven't turned out the way I've hoped, and so therefore I feel empty in life. Things are not happening for me. I'm always constantly waiting on the next thing. I always think that I'm going to finally arrive, and I never actually do. I feel the same I've always felt. In verse 18, as the story closes, Naomi says the final, these final words to Ruth. She says, wait, my daughter, until you've learned how the matter turns out. Isn't that life? Well, we'll see how this goes. We'll see what happens. I feel like my whole life and ministry I've been saying, all right, let's see what happens. Have you noticed that? That We never arrive. You never arrive. We never finally get there and we say, everything that has happened, that could happen, has happened, and I finally arrived. Nobody has ever said that in life. Madonna, I'll quote one uh, famous theologian, she, she said that she would come out with various albums. And after every album, as soon as that album was out, she felt like she has accomplished absolutely nothing and, and had to come out with something else in order to finally arrive. Do you realize that you can never arrive? The waiting is constant. We always think that arrival is right around the corner and then we go around the corner and yet there's another question mark. Another, uh, let's just see what happens. We can never arrive in this life. In church, family, that is why the world is empty. And that's why I fear so many of you are empty in life is because you believe that you are going to find fullness in the same way the world thinks they're going to find fullness. And you never will. Go ahead and try. Do your thing. Accumulate what you you want to accumulate. Get that job. Get that money. Get that uh, spouse. Get those kids. Get whatever you want to get. You won't find it in this world. Oh, and for those preachers who make the book of Ruth about dating, how to find a husband, they are gutting the book of Ruth from all of its power. Because it's not about temporal blessings in this world, but it's about the seed that came through the lineage of Ruth that ended up giving birth to a young man named David who became king through his seed, the child, Jesus Christ, born in the town of Bethlehem. In vain. In vain you search for fullness in this life. And I think it's a crying shame when people believe the basic doctrines of Christianity, yet organize their world, organize their entire life, chasing after all the same things that this world chases after. And you know why? It's because you've never really realized that you were once naked and enslaved by a foreign master. In Ezekiel chapter 16, God picks up some of this Ruth narrative, I believe. You can read the whole chapter later. As God's talking about his love for his people. 
And in Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 1, God says to His people that you were born of a foreigner. You've got foreign parents. In, in verse 2, He says that you were thrown out into a field. You've, you've got nothing. You were left to die. And in verse 8, God says, later I passed by. And when I looked at you and saw that you were old enough for love, I spread the corner of my garment over you, marriage language, Cover me with your wings. And I covered your naked body. I gave you my solemn oath and entered into a covenant with you, declares the sovereign Lord, and you became mine. That's the gospel. That's the good news. That's where fullness is found. Fullness is found in this little baby that was born in Bethlehem some 2,000 years ago from now. Jesus Christ, also in Bethlehem. And by the way, unlike Ruth, there was no place for Jesus to live. Jesus took the debt that you owed. A debt that you could not pay off. A debt that Mike Roach so uh, vividly explained to us last week. A debt that you could never pay off. You needed a Redeemer. And you had a kinsman. You had a brother who came and said, I can pay this off for you and redeem all that you are. He came and on the cross, he took the debt that you owed and he paid all of your debt. There's a story where Jesus is with his disciples. And his disciples are hungry and eating, and it's past lunchtime. And they come to Jesus, and Jesus hasn't eaten yet. And they say, Jesus, aren't you hungry? And Jesus says, oh, I have food that you don't know about. When I was in Sunday school, I thought that Jesus was talking about some cookies that he had hidden in his little sack. And it wasn't until later I realized, no, he's actually talking spiritually and figuratively. Jesus is saying, I have a fullness that you don't know about. Listen, the world doesn't understand the fullness that you have. Naomi could not understand the fullness that Ruth could have or that anybody could have in the midst of trials. When I was a child, we sang the song, Count Your Many Blessings. Name them one by one. uh, Naomi would have said, yeah, I'll count my blessings. Here they are. Zero. Because you don't understand the fullness that you have In Christ, blessings far beyond anything that this world can provide or afford you. Blessings that can only be found recognizing that you have a debt that needed to be paid and that Jesus paid it all. Oh, I've got fullness that you don't know about. You see, the God of of temporal satisfaction comes along and says, oh, but you don't have fill in the blank. He comes along and says, well, don't you want fill in the blank? Yes, those things would be nice, but I have a fullness that you know nothing of. You know, Ruth and Boaz is a love story, but it's not a love story about Ruth and Boaz. This is a love story about God and you. A a, a God who came into this world and took on flesh. That's the miracle we talk about at Christmas time. Who died on the cross in your place. And then three days later, He rose from the dead and ascended into the clouds. And one day, He will come again. And He will receive you as a bride, beautifully dressed for Him, the groom. Do you know this God? Do you know this fullness? Are you empty? Listen, outside of Christ, you are absolutely empty. I want you to know that. If Christ is not your Savior, you are more empty than you will ever imagine. But church, in Christ, for those who hear this good news... And say, yes, that's good news. Is it good news, church? 
yes, that's good news. That's mine. I, I receive this. Christ is mine. He's my groom. I'm His bride for those who receive this. Oh, we have a fullness that you know nothing of. So instead of wishing that I had somebody else's life, I ought to just be thankful that God has my life. Instead of wishing that I would have made different choices in this life, I ought to just be thankful for the fact that God chose me and take refuge under His wings. He's covered your nakedness. He's covered your shame. May we be like these harvesters who are singing these songs down on the threshing floor, praising God for covering us for coming to us, protecting us, loving us. Church, in Christ, you are not empty. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the fullness that we have in Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, that you would take these truths, that you would plant them in us, that they would change us. It's in Jesus' name we, we, we pray. Amen.